So what are you, scared? No, I'm not scared. Around these parts, we haven't been as critical of the 90s horror scene as most, but let's all admit that 1997 wasn't the most fertile period. Freddy and Jason had been banished to development hell, Michael Myers was in limbo, Chucky hadn't reinvented himself just yet, and the brief post screen boom hadn't quite kicked in. However, horror doesn't revolve around old school slasher icons, and there are still a few cinematic gems that popped up throughout the year. With that, as we truck along with our year by year breakdown, we present to you the 10 best horror films of 1997. In Disney's Aladdin, a genie is the catalyst for a wealth of comedic and pop culture tinged mayhem. And the same is true for 1997's Wishmaster. However, the pop culture references in Wishmaster are such that only horror fanboys and fangirls will appreciate. And the mayhem, while still comedic in tone, is more of a guy skeleton rips out of its own body variety. The premise of Wishmaster goes like this. If you wake a genie, he will grant you three wishes. Upon granting the third wish, all of his fancy genie buddies get to enter our world and take over. The movie was directed by Robert Kurtzman, one third of the amazing K&B FX house. So you know, even before you get started, that at least the effects are going to be awesome. And indeed, the opening scene in ancient Persia where the genie mutilates various people is freaking amazing. And again, as we've already touched on, how could any horror fan not love watching a guy's skin ripping off and a skeleton coming out to attack people? Run, insect. Run and tell those you will what you will. Tell them there is something loose in their city. Something which feeds on wishes. A law student takes a job as a night watchman in a morgue, thinking this will give him some time to study. Meanwhile, a serial killer is on the loose, and the student ends up getting mixed up with one of the murders, becoming a suspect. Morgue's serial killer's necrophilia, Danish director Old War Needle, has all kinds of juicy and freaky to toy with. In this English language remake of his own 1994 film, the atmosphere starts on the creepy early and keeps the suspense tight with dark scenery and chilling isolation. Even with some more humor, fun naughty, and a touch of coming of age tossed into the spooky, there's plenty of real world fear to match. Got marriage issues, fear of life after college, losing buddies over dames, it all helps to keep the characters believable. It's not perfect. Careful viewers may suspect or solve the twist pretty quickly, and the scares really only work on the first viewing. Having said that, there are still plenty of unique and morbid thrills. Joys in spotting the clues and jump in your seat delights here for repeat viewings. Duty nurse. Yeah, I had this night watchman from all three and the alarm just went off. The, the alarm? The, the, the alarm from the morgue just went off. You said, what was that? The alarm from the morgue is going off. A homicide detective and an anthropologist try to destroy a South American lizard-like god who's on a people-eating rampage in a Chicago museum. The Relic is an atmospheric, sinister, dark car movie that will scare the hell out of you. Or at least entertain you sufficiently. There's a lot of gory decapitations and the creature effects from Stan Winston Studios are beautifully done. It's definitely worth the time of anyone who likes a good old-fashioned monster movie. Three years ago, an entomologist genetically created an insect to kill cockroaches, carrying a deadly disease. Now, the insects are out to destroy their only predator, mankind. For Guillermo del Toro's second feature film, the biggest asset is the production design. Mimic has a delicious horror atmosphere that you could cut with a knife. Gloom, decay, and disturbing, unidentifiable biological masses are the visual themes. The creature designs are fantastic with the mimicking design being the most impressive. Of course, the plot is somewhat predictable, and the don't tamper with nature subtext is as conspicuous here as it was in a movie like Frankenstein. But predictability isn't a flaw here, and Frankenstein was a masterpiece. Mimic has an absorbent story with likable characters and suspense to spare. Do you have the time? So the time? Four 
teens share an ominous pact one faithful July 4th evening. After accidentally colliding with a mysterious stranger crossing a barren, secluded portion of highway, they dispose of the body rather than face their responsibilities and report the tragic incident. Now, on the anniversary of wicked indiscretion, a mysterious force has returned with redemption in mind and terrifying taunts of, you get the picture. Today, telling somebody I know what you did last summer and meaning it as a threat just wouldn't fly. Everybody knows what you did last summer. It's all over social media. We've seen your cringe Photoshop Instagram selfies and your awkward TikToks. You want no seasoning on that? Mm -hmm. Oh, cook them a little. Fair enough. Back in the GeoCities land of 1997 though, things were different. It was almost possible to keep things private. Almost out there and he's watching us and waiting. What are you waiting for, huh? What are you waiting for? Do you like scary movies? Director Wes Craven and writer Kevin Williamson decided most people probably did. With 1996's Scream, they breathed life into a flagged genre by creating a new knife on an icon who, crucially, was aware of all the horror movie villains who'd gone before. The second film of the Scream franchise follows Sydney Prescott as she, after enduring the horrors of the first film, moves away to go to college. With most of her friends dead, she intends to make a clean break and restart her life. But she's haunted by her past, seeing ghosts, or ghost face, everywhere she looks. And unfortunately, it turns out she's not just imagining it, like you'd expect from any self-respecting slasher sequel. The body count is higher and the kills are gorier. Where Scream was riffing on the slasher genre, Scream 2 is riffing on the slasher sequel and having loads of fun with it. Why not set your goals higher, huh? You wanna be one of the big boys? Huh? Manson? Bundy? OJ? Son of a Put it delicately, it's probably safe to say that director Paul W.S. Anderson has released some iffy films over the years, from Death Race, Pompeii, and pretty much every Resident Evil movie. But before all those films, way back in 1997, he directed Event Horizon, which is arguably his best movie to date. The story takes place in the year 2047 as a group of astronauts are sent to investigate and salvage a long lost starship. The ship disappeared mysteriously seven years before on its maiden voyage, and with its return comes even more mystery as a rescue crew discovers the real truth behind its disappearance and something even more terrifying. A skill in the predictable plotting and happy endings of similar big budget productions, Event Horizon emerges as a truly twisted, nightmarish shocker. The film's screenwriter pitched his idea to Paramount Pictures as The Shining in Space. A more accurate pitch would have been Hellraiser in Space. Vacate, I want off this ship. You can't leave. She won't let you. You just get your gear and get back on the Lewis and Clark Doctor or you'll find yourself walking home. I am home. Based on Stephen King's 1988 novel of the same name, The Night Flyer follows a sleazy reporter who catches a killer who may or may not be a vampire. Given that it's Stephen King we're talking about, the ultimate twist probably won't surprise you. This might seem like a bold statement, but The Night Flyer is arguably one of the 15 to 20 best vampire films out there. Certainly when it comes to the 1990s, very few films trump it. And the subsequent decades haven't produced too many stronger subgenre works either. It's an awesome and underrated movie that all vamp fans should see at least once. Just under a decade before a man and his tricycle loving puppet friend took over the game, a little movie called Cube was the standard bear for locking strangers together in an area lousy with traps. The premise goes like this. Six complete strangers of wildly varying personality characteristics are involuntarily placed in an endless maze containing deadly traps. Traps including acid sprayers, sound activated spikes, and screens of razor wire. The usual rounds of what are we doing here questions follow. The answer is revealing the very specific role each member of the party has to play in order to make it out alive. Cube is one of those rare films that make you itch uncomfortably on the inside. With its enigmatic and simple premise, this works best as a series of nerve-stretching suspense sequences as the characters try to get past the killing traps. Funny Games is a non-stop assault on the senses that takes and takes emotionally and with no reciprocation. 
From the moment the two antagonists appear on screen, an eerily polite and well-dressed pair of sociopaths until the moment the credits are over, Funny Games twist at a well-earned knot of tension and never lets up. It leaves you feeling as good horror should, drained and deeply affected. In the film, the aforementioned two young men take a mother, father, and son hostage in a vacation cabin and force them to play sadistic games with one another for their own amusement. Here, director Michael Haneke is undoubtedly inciting the concept of dramatized violence. As an audience, a a movie such as this usually gives us the role of passive antagonists. We are immaterial voyeurs, and as a result, we leave the film with that morbidly satisfied feeling that only horrific imagery can evoke. Funny Games gives us tangibility where we may not want it. It acknowledges our presence across the fourth wall several times throughout in order to make us feel more participant than observer. It is much harder to glean satisfaction from the imagery when we feel personally included in what made it horrific. Once again, thanks for watching, and don't forget to share your favorite movie of the year in the comment section below. So what are you, scared? No, I'm not scared.